Welcome. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. Excited to be with you today. Have you ever looked back in your life and gone, man, I was an idiot. Like you just look back and there was a time of your life, you did some dumb things, you regret some things, you look back. I was sharing with Billy and Ron and a few friends about my college experience and I pulled up some pictures from my college experience and I looked back and I'm like, Man, I was kind of an idiot. So that was me with the long hair. I actually had hair down to here. It was very straight. Girls would ask me, how do you straighten it so straight? And I would go, it's just that straight. Uh, so it, it was an interesting time of life. And I remember in my college years doing some bonehead things and getting involved in some things that I regret doing. And in my sophomore year of college, actually, God completely transformed my life. Uh, a guy invited me to be a part of this Bible study that was very similar to what we do in Simple Church now. And I go to this Simple Church, and I start just going, man, God, I, I started experiencing God, and he started doing things. And I was not, I did not have all my stuff together at all. And I remember God asking me, I felt like he was calling me to do three things. That I, I just needed to do three things to kind of go to the next step with my relationship with him. And the first one was to break up with my girlfriend of three and a half years. The second one was to start reading the Bible. And the third one was to start sharing God's story with my friends. And you know what I did? I felt the Lord stir in my heart, and I go, I'm going to do that. And I didn't have it all together. I didn't do it perfect, but I broke up with my girlfriend. I started reading the Bible, and I started sharing God's story with others. And actually, if you're a college student, that's some pretty good advice I just want to give you right now. Break up with your girlfriend or boyfriend. <laughs> start, start reading the Bible and sharing the gospel with others. Most of you will not be with the person you're... Uh, dating your freshman year, except if you're Billy Sprague, our family life pastor. Him and his wife have been together since they were 14. They were a Disney princess story. But the rest of us, we had to go through a breakup with someone like that. But as I looked through my life, I saw that God transformed my life when I was faithful to do what he asked me to do. When I got out of my comfort zone, transformation is always a product of faithfulness in the season you're in. Let me say that one more time. Transformation in your life is always a product of faithfulness in the current season that you are in. And today we're going to jump back. We're looking at the books, book of Acts, and we'll be in Acts 18 today. And I want to show you a few ways how you can grow and develop and be faithful to what God has called you to do. But before we do that, I want us to look at maybe what holds us back. Like what holds us back from doing what God calls us to do? We all might be stirred like, I'm supposed to do this, but what holds us back? Maybe it might be your family background. Maybe it's church hurt. Maybe it's you've been burned. Maybe it's anxiety. Maybe it's trauma in your life. Those things all hold us back from being faithful to what God calls us to now. But I do believe there's actually a thing below the thing. And it's these two underlying thinking that come upon us. And it's these two thinkings. It's this. It's the belief that our next season of life will be better. When my kids are out of the house, then life will be better. We have a tendency to believe that the season we're in, what God's called us in this moment, is not that great, and the next season will be better. In James 4, this is what we read. It says, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city. We'll spend a year there and carry on business and make money. Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? It's a mist that appears for a little while, then vanishes. We are not promised the next season of our life. We are almost only promised today. So if we think next year or the next season will be better, it holds us back from being faithful to what God has for us today. The other thinking is, and belief is that the previous season of life was better. The older and older and older you get, sometimes you look back and you go, those were the good old days. I wish I could go back when this was true or when my life was like this or when I lived there. In Ecclesiastes 7.10, we hear this. It says, do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. We see these two mindsets 
life will be better in the next season or it was easier in the previous season. We see them affect every part of our lives. I see it even as my kids grow up. Like my kids are always like, oh, I want the next thing or the next season or I want to be in the next grade or I want the next toy. It's always the next, the next, the next. And, you know, it's graduation season right now, so everybody wants to, you know, graduate. It, by the way, there are so many graduations of everything now. They're graduating kids from, like, swim class, like, putting on caps and gowns. They're doing it, like, third grade, free school. Yeah. Uh, this makes me sound really old. Back in my day, we only graduated from high school and college. That was the only honor you got to wear the cap. So last, a couple weeks ago, my daughter Eden graduated preschool. This is my daughter Eden. Going into kindergarten, I can't believe she, she completed preschool. She worked so hard. And I was going there, and I'm like, are we serious? We're going to do this? And then I show up, and I see her looking like that, and I'm like, I'm so glad we're doing this. <laughs> I see why we're graduating the preschoolers to the kindergartners. <laughs> but every season of life, don't we long for the next too much? And we make excuses and we go, if the next thing would happen, then my life would change. Maybe you're middle school and you go, when I get to high school, then I will care about my grades because they actually matter. It's always about the next thing. When I get out of college, then I will start, stop partying so much. When I get married, then I will be sexually pure. When I get more flexibility in my work, then I will read the Bible. When I make more money, then I'll start tithing. When our kids are just a little bit older, then we will join that simple church. When I get more training, then I'll share my faith. When my kids are grown and they're adults, then I will actually make our relationship right. When I'm done traveling, then I'll do what God asked me to do and I'll serve him more. We live in a, if I do this, then, when this happens, then I will be faithful to God. What if it's not the season's fault for our spiritual lack of depth and growing and our dissatisfaction with our life? Maybe we shouldn't look at the season as, ah, it's this season's fault that I'm not satisfied. When maybe we should be looking to, how is God calling me to live right now? How am I supposed to be faithful to what he wants me to do no matter my season of life, no matter what is going on, no matter what obstacles that are in front of me, what does God want me to do today? And if we lived in a present faithfulness to God, then we would experience God more. Antelone France said this, all changes, even the most longed for, have their melancholy. For what we leave behind us is a part of ourselves. We must die to one life before we can enter another. I think the reason it's hard to navigate life is because life, if you're going to transform your life, if you're going to become new, it becomes death to the old things to leave behind and become a new person. And how this death happens is it happens through you being faithful right now to what God is asking you today. So today, we're just going to jump in. I want us to look through Acts 18, and we're going to see how Paul navigates his life and what God has called him to do and how he is to be faithful to God. So Acts 18.1 is where we'll jump in today, and it says this, after this, Paul left Athens, and he went to Corinth. Amen. So good, isn't it? Do you guys feel that? That's the spirit working. Okay, so here's what's going on. Paul is on this journey, and he's actually going through big cities all of a sudden. Athens, we all know Athens and Greece. It's still there today. Big city, and he's moving to Corinth. And, and Paul is this, like, transient person. He was a persecutor of followers of Jesus. Then he has this radical conversion to Jesus, and then he becomes a disciple. And he's gone through all these seasons of life. And this season of his life is he is now going after big cities. So Corinth is a big city. He leaves Athens and comes to Corinth. A lot of times when you think of your Bible, you think of, like, Paul rolling in and the town's, like, this big. It was 700,000 people. 
It was a huge city, almost three quarters of a million people. And Paul walks into this town. It was uh, destroyed in 146 B.C., the city of Corinth. And then when Romans occupied it in 46 B.C., Julius Caesar made a decree and they rebuilt the city because it was on two ports. So it became a center for trade and for communication throughout the Roman Empire. And Paul's heart was that he wanted to see the message of Jesus spread throughout all of Rome and all the world. And he believed if he could get on these strategic trade routes, that that then would push the gospel to the ends of the earth. So as Paul walks in trying to change this city of 700,000 people, do you know what the feeling that rushed on him was? He had a ton of worry a ton of fear, and a ton of anxiety. So we're in a book of Acts, and so this is his first journey to the Corinthian church. And in your Bible, there's the, one of the books is called Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. It's actually the letter, after Paul leaves Corinth, he writes a letter back to the Corinthians. And in 1 Corinthians, he actually shares his feeling of walking into this huge city. And it says this, it says uh, that he walked in, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is what Paul says. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. The dude walks into Corinth trembling. Why? Two reasons. They were a prideful people and they had tons of sexual immorality rampant through the city. The Corinthians were very proud. They are intellectually arrogant. They boasted of their wealth and their culture. They had this world-famous Isthmian Games that they hosted every other year. And it was actually a very politically prestigious, even over Athens. And so they were, these were prideful people that boasted in their culture, boasted in their wealth. And then secondly, there was the Temple of Aphrodite. The Temple of Aphrodite was the goddess of love. And in her temple had a thousand prostitutes that were slaves that would roam the streets of Corinth at night, luring and being sexually promiscuous all around the streets. Corinth was a dark place that Paul was scared to go to. If you had a friend and you wanted to insult them, you could call them a Corinthian. That basically meant you're, you're like a prostitute. You know, that's my Corinthian friend. You don't call somebody a Corinthian friend. So here's Paul. He's in this city. And honestly, as he looks at Corinth, he's like, man, they kind of made Vegas look like Disneyland. It's like, oh, this, is, this isn't that bad. So Paul's worried. He's fearful. And he, you know what he does in Acts 18.11 is this. It says, so Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the word of God. Paul's MO when he would go places is he would stay in these missionary journeys for like a couple weeks, meet a couple people apiece, start a church, move on. He may stay a couple months, but that was like his longest time. Paul, at this time, he goes, I'm going to plant myself in this city that needs Jesus, that I am so scared to be at, and I'm going to be faithful to where God has called me to because this city needs Jesus. And he stays a year and a half. And so today, I want to share with you the lessons I see from Paul's journey in Corinth to spend a year and a half in this city. And, it, you know, it's different living in a city than the suburbs. When I came to Colorado, I lived in Erie, Colorado. It was like 2014. We had a Walgreens and a bunch of residential places. And one day we got a Burger King, and it really became a big town. But everybody's the same. That's what I... I it's, you think it's nice, like, oh, everybody kind of thinks the same, it's super safe, everyone has two and a half kids, like, this is great. But honestly, like, when you come to the city, I love the city because you have diversity, you have culture, you have the spreading of ideas, you have just this amazing ability to communicate to the world, yet we know living in a city is somewhat more difficult than living away from this city. I, I was in Tampa, Florida, and we were looking at houses when we were there, and we are like, I could get a mansion. <laughs> like, like, it's amazing the, how, the price of housing even. So living in a city, also there's higher crime. There's division. But God, I believe, wants to use cities to change the world. I think that's why Paul stood a year and a half in his city where God called him. I don't know where you live in our city, but I have a huge heart for the city of Denver. 
The city of Denver has about 1% to 3% of the people that actually live in Denver City, not suburbs, the city of Denver. It's 1% to 3% Christian. There are not many followers of Jesus in this city. That is why I am so amazed and thankful to the Lord and passionate about how this church is growing because we're in the heart of our city and God is using us to be a people because if it's not us, then who? We're to be faithful to this city. It is a joy to get to live in this city. It is a joy to get to impact the people around us. And our prayer is just like Paul, even though it might be a little bit difficult at times, that God wants to do something amazing here. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul goes on to say this about his situation in Corinth. He said, Every, each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. So God's called you to be exactly where you're at now. It is not to go, I need to get out of this. It's to remain faithful to God in this. So wherever you're at in your life, it is to remain faithful to the season he has in you. So there, I want to share with you guys five ways that I saw as we read through the rest of the passage of how we as people can be faithful to the things that God has for us. So the first way that we might be faithful in our season right now is we need to work diligently. We need to be faithful to work diligently. So we pick up in our text in Acts 18, 2. It says this, There, Paul met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Paul goes into the city, and he needs money. He needs provision. Paul walks in, and a lot of the, his journeys, he would get connected with churches, and they would actually provide financially for him as he did the work of the church. When he walks into Corinth, this huge city, he feels a burden on his soul that he does not want to be a burden to the church, so he's not going to take any money. So he, he starts a business. He meets two other followers of Jesus that had gotten pushed out, Aquila and Priscilla. We'll learn more about them next week. And he goes and starts this business, and they're tent makers. And we know they made tents, but also they're just leather workers. So it's all leather business. And he created this business to provide for himself. How do I know that Paul worked diligently? I know it because Paul had a passion. The reason he was in Corinth was to see Jesus' name proclaimed. And so he knew that if he wanted to see that happen, he had to provide. So he went and worked really hard. And do you see what he did on his off day, on his Sabbath? He went and watched golf. It's amazing. No. He went to the synagogue and shared the gospel. So in his off time, he was like, I'm going to go do ministry. There's so many hurting, helpless people here. I want to reach them for Jesus. He would work hard, and then he would also use his time to impact God's kingdom. He also says this, Paul does in Colossians 3. He says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Whatever you do, wherever you're at, maybe you're a student right now. Maybe you're doing a part-time job. Maybe you're retired. Maybe you have a full-time job. God Ask us if we want to be faithful, we should work diligently at that job and what he's put in front of us. That we are to be diligent with our time, no matter our position. We are not to work for, the, for others, for your boss. You don't work for an earthly boss. You work for a heavenly father. And he gives an inheritance, and he asks us to be faithful to that. You might be here today, and you might be like, dude, Jason, I hate my job. I, I, if you read lots of statistics right now, most people are starting to dislike their job more and more. And you go, I don't like it. These are not my passions. I want to get out of this job. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. What I would say to you is God wants you to work diligently where you're at right now. It's not about if you're in your passions. Because Paul's passion, what was it? To make disciples, to preach the gospel. I don't think he went to Corinth and he's like, Man, I can't wait to make tents. Like, it's going to be awesome. And they're probably day in and day out. He's probably like, this kind of sucks. I don't want to do this anymore. But we are to work diligently where God has placed us, even if it doesn't line up with what we're passionate about now. Because when we're faithful with a little, 
God says we will be entrusted to be faithful with more. So we must be faithful to work diligently. And if you're 50 or older, I want to hear a little amen for us younger people. Amen. Amen. I feel like my generation and the generation below me, we can cop out a lot of times and say, well, that's not our passion when we're just called, God calls us to work diligently. Then what happens is Paul is, so he's, he's not honestly a full-time vocational minister. His job is not ministry. He's tent maker, but he believed his life was ministry. We are all full-time ministers. No matter if it's your vocational job. Because Paul wasn't his vocational job, but he was a full-time minister. He used his time wisely. And then in verse 5, it goes on, and there's a transition that happens. And in verse 5, it says, when Silas, these are kind of his disciples, his boys that he's been doing ministry with. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching and testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. So What happens is Silas and Timothy, they actually took up an offering at other churches, and then they take it to Paul, and now Paul leaves tent making behind. He's no longer a tent maker, and he goes exclusively into sharing the gospel and setting up shop there. So no no matter what, Paul was working for God. I want to show you a good friend of mine. His name is Jay Tindra Singh. Let's give it up for Jay. Jay's awesome. You ever meet Jay? You ever want your life to be changed? If you ever need prayer, just go find Jay and, like, talk to him. He he grew up in India. He told me some – I was with him this week at a conference. He told me some crazy stories. He's like, one time this Black Panther jumped over me. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, I was a kid, and he jumped over me. I'm like, sweet, man. He's like, the Lord protected me. I'm like, oh, thank you. It's awesome. But Jay is amazing. He left India because of persecution, actually. He was sharing the gospel so much, he was – threatened for his life and was going to die from his family. He comes to America and God has been using Jay. He's part of our church to do amazing things. And over this last year, we've actually been helping Jay start, he's been starting simple churches with refugees, with immigrants, and God has been doing some amazing, amazing things. And Jay has actually seen multiplication, like a simple church starts another simple church that starts another simple church. He actually collected all the data and got all the names, and there are 465 simple churches that Jay's multiplication strand has affected in, like, our city. Isn't that amazing? And so we're like, that's pretty amazing. And then he was like, oh, yeah, I, I've had 131 baptisms. And we have all the names of all the people who are like, this year, you had 131 baptisms? But a year ago, Jay was actually at a place where he was struggling financially, and he had to go, he was working part-time and doing ministry part-time, and he needed a full-time job. So he was willing, he worked his tail off to make it work, and finally couldn't make it work anymore, so he went and got a job at United. And four days before he took his job at United, Ron and I and a few others were talking to Jay, and we're like, dude, you were like, stinking apostle Paul. Like, we need you in our city. Like, I I don't need you working 50 hours at United. Like, what God might do if we might provide the resources and time, which we've seen 465 simple churches in a year. You're like, oh my goodness, if we were to provide that? So in four days, we raised Jay's complete salary to provide for him to go full-time ministry, and God has used that. And as a church, we continually provide, we support, we stand behind Jay financially, prayerfully. He was in the last service. We pray over him, and we see God move through him. That, so in any season of life, Jay is an extreme. All of us are like, I'm, I'm, like, I'm not going to be Jay. But we're all called to be full-time ministers wherever God has called us. We're to be faithfully diligent to work at what God is calling us to. So our first lesson from Paul, if we want to be faithful, is that we need to be faithful to work diligently. The second is to be faithful to your spiritual family. To be faithful to your spiritual family. Again, we see Priscilla and Aquila come up. This is Paul's friends that he met. And it says this in verse 2 and 3. It says, Paul went to see them. These were these other believers because he was at the city alone. He went and saw them. He actually stayed with them. And then he started working with them. And so all of a sudden he becomes this relationship with Aquila and Priscilla. Why does he need this relationship? Corinth is hard. Is it hard to live in a place where no one else values the things that you value? 
Do you ever feel alone? Like, I'm the only one that follows Jesus and anyone I know. It is hard to do this life alone. And Paul was not a rock star where he's like, I don't need anyone else. I'm a maverick. I can do whatever I want. No, he goes, I need a spiritual family. I need people to encourage me, to love me. What we do as simple church is basically that. It's three things. We love God, we love others, and we make disciples. That's what a spiritual family is. And Paul goes, I need a spiritual family. This is a picture of my spiritual family. It's a few weeks ago. Uh, we were celebrating my buddy Tim's birthday. I love Eden's face. It's great. Uh, so we, were, we had this barbecue out at my house in Sloan's Lake, and we're getting it all together, and we're like, it's awesome. And we actually go play a game of pig out in my front yard because I have a basketball goal. And all of a sudden, everybody, if you'll see, started bringing out their, like, lawn chairs. So we just moved the party to the front yard, which is, like, not a normal thing to do. We Like, Sloan's Lake's getting too uppity. We're trying to bring a hood back to Sloan's Lake. It was like a show. It was like Fast and the Furious. We're having the party, a barbecue in the front yard versus the backyard. But we're there, and something beautiful happened. After we're hanging out a bunch, we formed this big circle and we called it like an honor circle. And for about 45 minutes, we spoke true things about Tim. Life into Tim. How much we loved Tim. How much we believed in Tim. How much we care for Tim. And every single person went around. All of us were in tears. And it was just a glimpse of how beautiful a spiritual family is. Because it's not like the rest of the world where we dig at each other, poke at each other. We're not for each other. No, we have each other's back and we love one another. If we are to be faithful in our season now, we need to be faithful to our spiritual family. And one of the easiest things to neglect in life is life gets busy in a season and you forget your spiritual family family. If you're not a part of one of our simple church or have a group of people that you do life like this with, I would encourage you, I would beg you, consider being a part of one. We have signups outside where we will help you connect in a spiritual family. We also love helping other people start spiritual families. We would love, love, love for you to experience that. Um, yeah, I should talk about that. I make decisions up here. Uh, okay, spiritual family. One thing one thing I see a lot of times, I'm just going to talk to anyone that's single and dating right now for a second. Uh, I see this happen is people that dig deep into community and go, I'm going to commit to a spiritual family. I'm going to commit to serving. I'm going to commit to people around me. They have a really high likelihood, I can't make any promises here, of finding a significant other. What I see happen a lot, though, is people get involved in a community like this. I also help run the brook with my wife, Molly. And you come to something, and you're like, you look around, you try to get everything out of it for yourself, and you try to meet all the people, then you don't get a date, and you're like, okay, next community, then next community, then next church, then next church, then next church. And what that does is almost like hopping from bar to bar to bar to bar to bar. What I've seen God do, though, is when we are faithful, to go, I'm going to be committed to a spiritual family. This might not be your spiritual family that you want to be committed to. That is quite okay. It's not a, a, like a saying, I might get you a spouse. But you need to commit to your spiritual family, and I promise you, God will be faithful. We have to believe God will be faithful. And I've seen it time and time again when people commit, God does something. So commit to making time for your spiritual family. Be there in their need. Lay down your life for your brothers and sisters in Christ. What we see next in Paul's journey of faithfulness, we see that we are to be faithful in opposition. Faithful in opposition. Whatever season you are in life right now, you will have hardship. You will have problems. You will have people come against you. You will not have it all together. I promise you, I promise you, every season I've ever gone through, there is always opposition. In Acts 18.6, we continue on with Paul's story, and it says this, But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. For now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justice, a worshiper of God, and Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. What happens? Paul gets pushed out. So remember his, his MO, he goes to the synagogue, 
he, he starts sharing the gospel, and the synagogue leader uh, pushes him out and says, you got to get out of here. There's opposition that happens. And so what does Paul do? I love it. it he literally goes, here's the synagogue. I'm going to just go next door to Justice House, and I'm going to share with him. And he starts a simple church literally right next door to the synagogue. And what's so amazing is there's this opposition, but Paul sees it as an opportunity. When you face opposition in your life, maybe it's an opportunity. <laughs> what I, I find uh, just amazing is how Paul knows that he, he's like started this simple church over here. And did you catch what happens? Who's Crispus? The synagogue leader. So wait a second. Let me get this straight. Paul's like, okay, I'm going to go start this new simple church over here with justice. Crispus is now the leader of the synagogue. He sees what's happening next door, and he puts his faith in Jesus, and his whole family gets baptized. His oppressor becomes his partner. God uses this opposition to create an unbelievable opportunity. God uses it. Do you have any opposition in your life right now? Do you have any difficulty? I just want you to think, where in your season of life, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your job, maybe it's your friends. Do you have any opposition? Do you have any pushback? What I would ask you to bring before the Lord, even in worship today, is what is the opportunity? What might God be doing through the opposition? There might be an opportunity. The fourth way we see God using Paul and his circumstance and how we should be faithful is we are to remember God's faithfulness. We are not faithful because we're just good people. We were faithful first because he was faithful. He went to the cross. He died. He laid it down his life for you. We don't just muster up faithfulness. No, we remember that God is ultimately faithful to us. And Paul gets this reminder too in verse 9. It says, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you. No one's going to attack and harm you. Because I have many people in this city. In every season of our life, we need to remember God's faithfulness to us. How he came and he rescued us. I think of my sophomore year of college and I think how God transformed my life. And I remember throughout every season how he has always been faithful. He's never strung me out to dry. He's always been there. It's, never, it's not that it's easy, but he is faithful to the end, he will make right on every single one of his promises to us. God is faithful. It's interesting. The last part is kind of a funny little twist in verse 10. It says, I'm with you. No one's going to attack you and harm you because I have many people in this city. I have many people in this city. It's, he was going like, you know, it seems really dark. It seems really hard. I know Corinth is crazy, but there's a lot of people here. There's a lot of people that are open to the things of God. I believe in our city there's a lot of people that are open to the things of God. You might not know it. You might not know who they are, but they're open and they are waiting for someone to share about Jesus. I hear story after story after story of people bringing their neighbors or talking to coworkers, and they didn't think that they were going to be open to the things of God, and then all of a sudden they are. There are many people here that are open to the things of God. I'll just kind of walk through it. Verse 12 through 17, I'll just tell you the story because it's kind of confusing and how we see this. But all of a sudden, so Paul gets kind of this like, he's stirred up so much because he's stolen the synagogue leader over here. And the new synagogue leader whose name is so Sosthenes is over here. And he stirs up trouble for Paul. And he actually brings Paul and the Jewish council to the Roman council and to this Roman guy named Galileo, who Galileo is, is the pro council over all of this mess. And they, they share, well, Paul's stirring up all this thing in the synagogue and he's taking people away. And the Roman go, we do not care. This isn't even a misdemeanor. Like, why are you bringing this to us? Very interesting thing. That was a huge way that God was protecting Paul. That was God's faithfulness 
right there. Because if they had made this ruling where they go, yeah, the Romans had gone, yeah, Paul, you can't do that anymore. That crushes his entire missionary journey. No longer will he be effective. No longer will he eventually get to Rome. It, it totally sinks it. But God used the Roman people to protect him. And then very interesting happens. Sosthenes, Paul walks out. He's fine. Sosthenes, the guy that brought all this, the new synagogue leader, walks out. And all the Jews are super upset at Sosthenes, so they beat him to a pulp. That's what it says. They just beat him up. And you're like, why are you turning? They just were frustrated at someone. Okay, here's the crazy thing about this story. Remember, 1 Corinthians is the letter back. If you read your Bible, go to 1 Corinthians, and you'll see a guy's name in chapter 1 named Sosthenes as a brother of Christ. So, for a second, Paul goes over to Justice House. Crispus, he wins the synagogue leader over to faith. Sosthenes gets beat to a pulp and then comes to faith. They can't keep a synagogue leader over there. Paul keeps leading them to faith over and over and over again. See, God is faithful. He turns opposition into opportunity. And when we are faithful to the things of God, he provides time and time again for Paul. We remember God's faithfulness. And we'll close with this. How we are to be faithful in any season of our life as we are to be faithful to savor the season you're in. We are to be faithful to savor the season you're in. Acts 1.18. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria. You're only in this season for a moment. He was only in the season for a year and a half. You can only be faithful in this season during this season. You can only be faithful in a season while you're in the season. We have to be faithful now. We don't get it back. So we're to savor the moments we have. Whatever season you're in. I had a great dinner the other night, and I, I eat really fast. I like two minutes and I'm done. But I took a bite. If you've ever had food like this, you take a bite and you're just like, so good. Savor the moments you're in. Wherever God has placed you, in the good, the hard, wherever you're at in your life, it won't last long. Time is short. You won't have your health forever. Your kids won't be in the house forever. You're not going to have your college friends forever. Savor it. Make the most of this season and be faithful to what God is calling you. Because Jesus said in a parable, he said at the end of time when we meet him in eternity, he is going to welcome us. If we have put our faith in Jesus, if we've made him Lord over our life, if we've turned from living for ourselves and trusted him and we get eternity, what we're going to be met with are some words and I pray these words will be met for every single person in here. It is not, he's not going to say, you did a great job and you were so fruitful and you had this many simple churches and you led this many people to Christ. No, 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 no. He's going to look at you and he's going to go, well done, good and faithful servant. You're measured on your faithfulness. Not what we can be or what we should be later on when our season changes. Be faithful now to what God has called us. If you'll bow with me and let's pray. Lord, we want to be faithful people, but we can't do it without your strength. We can't do what you ask us to do on our own accord or our own power, but it is your spirit that lives in us, that we might have the spirit that was in Jesus Christ. It lives in us, that same resurrection power, that we might make the choices today, that we might be faithful in whatever situation we have, if it is to work diligently, if it's to be faithful to our spiritual family, if it's to be faithful in opposition, or it's just to savor the season we're in, God, we pray that we might be faithful people. So God, right now, I just pray a blessing over every single person that you would stir in their heart right now, what do I need to be faithful in today? And you would speak it to them. They would hear it. They would go, oh, that's what I should do. And then you would give them the power and strength through your spirit to do it. In your son's name, amen.